and I guess we're live. Okay, cool. So hi, Andres. Hi, everyone. Uh, how is it going? Hello. Um, doing well. How are you? <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, so thanks for being here today. Uh, okay, guys. So send us maybe your location here in the chat so we can see who's uh, who's online and where are you watching this webinar from. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm just going to give you a small tour, a uh, quick tour of a live stream. So as you saw, there is this chat. Then you have the question section where you can you know leave us your questions. I already sent some polls in the poll section. Uh, so yeah, just a few questions, um, and uh, and that's about it. Okay, cool. All right, so let's start. Um, all right, so Andrew, maybe just uh, Andrew. Sorry, <laughs> Andrus. <laughs> I was talking to some guy's name, Andrew. Uh, okay, so Andrus, uh, maybe can you tell us first um, who you are, what you do at PipeDrive, and what's PipeDrive after all? All right, so uh, Andrus, I'm from Estonia. Um, I'm a head of marketing at PipeDrive. Yeah, PipeDrive is a sales management tool that helps. Uh, small teams get organized and close more states. Cool. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, we are pipe drive, we are happy pipe drive users ourselves. It's yeah, as you said, it's great for teams that wants to get, you know, organized quick and easy. Really cool. Um and so since we are here to talk marketing and mostly marketing for early stage startup, maybe we can start with something really simple, which is, which is basically when you start a business, you take into account your market, right? And uh, from PipeDrive standpoint, uh, it seems for me that the CRM market seems pretty fragmented, right? There is a lot of actors, some, a lot of people doing CRM out there. How do you handle this specific aspect from a marketing standpoint? I mean, from day one. Yeah, it's definitely a, 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 a very busy market. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of different, different players who are largely undifferentiated. Um, and some of them, most of them actually, are much better funded than fight track. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so what, what I think got us off to a good start is, is focus on SMBs. So it's, I think in every mm -hmm. business, especially the global market, we are happy with small businesses uh, as our customers. Although we have some large teams like... Uh, Teams from Amazon and Samsung are using PipeDrive as well, but mm -hmm. more teams. So, do you think that the the, the, the Pipe Drive product was built from day one to uh, answer those small teams' needs, or was it something that pretty much came along with your marketing efforts? You know, you, you know, building your ICP. Um... Yeah, the focus for what early on was was not to please, um, not to please, kind of people. Or executive suits who, who need to see a fine reports, but it is to help the salespeople in small teams get more sales done. Uh -huh. So I think it's a, it's just it's a different starting point, and that um, and that I think has helped has helped to guide many decisions down the line. Okay, cool. Um, all right, and when you started, um, you know, as a small business, I mean, not now, but at the time. Uh, I mean, there is, I mean, just for us, for example, there is, I was doing some research and there is a ton of frameworks out there about marketing. You know, there is this R framework from uh, David McClure that is really well known. But from what I read, I mean, I did some research about your blog, about how you handle things at PipeDrive. And I believe you have, you know, you have elaborated your own framework. Can you tell us about more, more about that? Uh, yeah, I rolled, I rolled my own. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think as a, as a backstory, it's it's good to it's helpful to know um, uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, where he outlines his uh, hedgehog strategy, which is uh, uh, hedgehog does one only one thing and does it really well, uh -huh. as opposed to a fox who is a cunning animal who does lots of different skiing and and who's always trying to eat the fox, but the fox always just curls up. Uh, that's uh, that's a strategy in work, oh. uh, uh, and uh, and I I think I I made it uh, twice better by saying that uh, a startup uh, in its early days doesn't need to do one thing really well but two things really well, uh, so hence the two to the two hedgehog framework, um, and how I what I see as the two main things which a startup needs to get right, uh, especially mm -hmm. in the early days, later days as well, uh, one is. Uh, Focus on getting referrals. 
Okay. Which means getting uh, a decent, not a decent, getting a great product out and then working on triggers, incentives, uh, what would encourage people to share the product with their friends or colleagues. That's, yeah. that's interesting because basically you're saying that what you should focus on is not really marketing per se, but really product and focus on what the marketing get, that could be driven from the product. That is the referral, you know, and not doing pretty much like the common marketing channels that we use, like webinars, content or social media. What you're saying is that one thing that we focus on first uh, when you start a company is your product and drive marketing through the product. Yeah, and I think marketing can play a role there in customer development and, and kind of shaping what the product is. Uh -huh. um, uh, and definitely at the later stage when product is already kind of fully given out to the product team, marketing can still have work, work on uh, triggers, incentives, referral programs, and, and clearing the messaging so that it's easy to refer a product. Okay, cool. And how did you guys do it uh, at Pipedrive? What was the referral channels that you guys built? Well, referral program is something we... we um, so. We started that later, so I, th I don't think it makes sense to, to build a referral product uh, in the very early days because you okay. have nobody to refer you to. So I think we, we added that uh, maybe a year and a half or two years into the uh, life, life cycle of the business. Okay. Uh, so the early on was just founders had uh, deep insight of customer pain. Mm -hmm. They spent a lot of effort in designing a product which addresses that pain. Um, I, we had marketing help with messaging and, and kind of the brand aspect of it, and then uh, some triggers for, for helping people uh, realize that, hey, I can share this with a, with a friend or colleague. Okay, cool. So basically what you're saying is that uh, your founders had this deep insight. They were salespeople themselves. So they, have, they, they knew the pain points from your customers. So you basically take that foundation, build a product, help them, customize the message for the product, build like this package that we know uh, Pipedrive today. And then from there, you started doing referrals as you were getting some tractions and some people in, right? Uh, yeah, so I think in Pipedrive, it, it all sounds easy than it was uh, initially. Uh, yeah. In hindsight, kind of, yeah, that was what, what we did, I think. Uh, but the effect of that anyway was, we weren't kind of, I as aware of what we were doing uh, back then, but the effect of it was that we started getting lots of new customers from referrals, uh, which is thanks to the founder's early vision. Okay. Uh, so that's one hedgehog, one hedgehog down. Uh, <laughs> another hedgehog, much more accessible to us in the marketing realm, is, uh, is findability. I think the second uh, big topic, it's not a channel, it's a, it's like a big area of, of focus should be being findable. Uh -huh. Findable either in Google or in App Store or whatever channels are dominant for you. Uh -huh. But for us, uh, people usually discover uh, when they work in small businesses, they discover new software by talking to their friends and colleagues and, and, and Googling. So okay. for us, search was, a, was, a, search was, the, was the channel, but then the different ways you can get visible in, in Google I mean, that, that's a long list of, of channels. Uh, of yeah, software. sure. So free, free search, paid search, um, social media marketing, uh, PR. Hmm. Um, that, that's interesting. But you uh, did you focus on one channel in particular, like SEO, for example? Because what I, I get those, uh, I, I usually get the, the, the feedback from, I read somewhere, I think it was on Point Nine Capital blog, that basically that is infographic. And once you target like this small companies, mid-sized companies that you sell plans, let's say at $99 uh, per month, you can really afford to do some outreach sales, which is really expensive, but, and that justify, you know, having a sales team in setting enterprise plan. And then if you want to do some paid search, it's not, Usually you are on market that there is a lot of competition there. It's not really affordable for you now. So you are some place in between, you know, so what channel should we focus on, you know, uh, to be findable, as you say, should we do SEO? Should we do um, social media on specific, you know, specific small groups, specific niches, or how do you, how do you feel that what's your experience with Bad Bright, For example, did you focus on SEO first, for example? Yeah, in Python, um, all we could afford, afford early on was my two hands typing on a keyboard. 
So uh -huh. we, we wanted to do paid search, but we didn't have the, the funds. We didn't have a paid marketing budget. So we started with the kind of content work and this out of necessity. But in an ideal world, uh, you will have uh, like some funding and then uh, and perhaps a budget as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just uh, it's it's good to map out um, for the keywords which are relevant in in an industry. If you if you look at the, at the page one of Google, yeah. it's pretty evident. Is there a is there opportunity in going uh, with the uh, content SEO world? Maybe it's partnerships, maybe it's PR, maybe it's paid search, or a, or, mm -hmm. or, or the suitable combination of them. And and there, I think each business is really different, and there's no there's no one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, uh, depends. But for example, yeah, on specific market where there is a lot of competitions. Example for now, uh, for us, for Lifestorm, uh, for example, if you type webinar software, the I think the CPC is like eight bucks or something like that. So paid channels are really, really, you know, overpriced for us. Uh, this is why we choose, for example, to focus on SEO first. And paid channels maybe will come later. Uh, and plus, in, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that. And if you think about it, maybe you know, choosing the most affordable channels in the first place maybe is the right path to go. And as you get, as you said, as you get some fundings and some maybe some traction, it's time for you to experiment new things, maybe things you that you couldn't afford before. But it's, as you say, it's all a matter of testing and finding the right channel for your business because there is no, no fit size all, right? And I think what you said about the webinar software, I'm guessing that even with the content and SEO work, it is very hard mm. to be on the first page of that, for that query. Yeah. Uh, so competition is tough, uh, both on the organic side and the paid side. Exactly. This is why you have to focus on really long tail uh, keywords, you know, having target some specific uh, queries. For example, one thing that pretty much that works pretty good for us is, you know, webinar template spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, you know, that works pretty well for us. But if you type webinar software, yeah, that gets really hard. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, we quite have uh, the first keyword we looked at, that I looked at seriously for content work was was sales pipeline management software because that's what, what the tool was about. Huh. Uh, CRM software is uh, super expensive both on the yeah. paid side and, and I think an indirect cost also on the organic side. So going yeah. from something uh, slightly more descriptive, slightly more long term was, uh, was a better way to go because then, then at least you'll have some results. Uh, mm of a uh, month down the line. I, I believe that, uh, I mean, if you type any query that contains software, basically you can, you know, put like five bucks in your CPC and you make, you make plus five bucks in your CPC. It's yeah. like, as long as there is software, it comes really, really expensive. Um, okay, yeah. cool. Um, uh, maybe, yeah, sure. maybe one other thing, which is the rates of being findable is that, is that uh, one of the co-founders uh, very uh, cleverly uh, saw an opportunity in Google Chrome Web Store early on. When oh were, yeah, uh, which is um, wasn't like really like a search engine, but it, it was a new channel, and people were starting to look for software there. And mm. then, uh, and we built the Google Chrome um, Web Store extension. Uh, yeah, one of the first uh, CRMs there, and when we got a lot of um, traction and signups from that, because we were one of the first steps to really have a presence there. Mm. So. Probably there's always some some new channel or uh, I mean not every month or every quarter but uh, it's usually once or twice per year you have an opportunity to be in a channel early on. Okay, cool. And uh, did did that channel drive traffic, but as well as qualified traffic? Did you get any significant signups and growth from that specific channel? Yeah, it was uh, it wasn't super qualified, but the amount of traffic we got there uh, in the early days, especially, was uh, was really helpful. Because okay. there were only a small part converted, it was enough. I think at some point it was, we got one third of signups from from that channel. Oh, cool! Uh, that's a that's an only bit good. You make it now. I believe I I I feel that everybody has pretty much jumped on that boat, you know, and started you know publishing their own software on the Chrome extension web store. And I mean, there is a ton of software now. I mean, when you guys started, uh, you was pretty much on the first batch of early hackers to do that, you know, to drive tractions.
that now do you think that this channel is not dead but you know that is not driving so much traffic as it used to yeah definitely it, and the share has dramatically uh, decreased but i would argue that uh, there's like more and more SaaS companies have platforms yeah there are more different app stores from the big big pairs like uh, like um, microsoft to i kind of say google google Place and and uh, mm. iOS stores to to just kind of really big SaaS companies who have an ecosystem, uh, uh, and we've started to experiment with kind of these smaller ecosystems and uh, and our and some of the some of the results are quite encouraging. So there's okay. every 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 month there's a new platform launched where you can be uh, findable. Yeah, uh, f speaking of platforms, uh, do you? Uh, I think you know, but you know platforms such as uh, G2 Crowd or Captera or you know platforms like you can you know reference your SaaS business compared to you know and compare your software to all the others and submit reviews and stuff like that um do you think that those platforms drive a significant uh, traffic i mean qualified enough traffic or did you get any results from that i know you guys are listed that but i didn't i don't know if you guys uh, got some tractions from there and if you tried the paying programs from Captera, for example. Yes, we've tried, I think, all of them. Uh, all, not all of them. There's nothing, there's everything, every day there's something new. We've tried mm -hmm. a, a large number of different uh, kind of paid directories or discovery sites like that. Some of them are hugely profitable. Some of them okay. we would like to put as, we would like to put more money into them, but, uh, but we can't because of the limited volume. Others are less, uh, are less, I think, uh, less qualified traffic. Um, yeah. And I've, I'm, I've, I've spoken about that with other marketers and it seems it's slightly different in different verticals. Oh yeah? Do you sense. believe that for CRMs it means, makes sense, for example? Yeah, for, uh, for CRMs, some of, the, some of the ones, and I would prefer not to say which ones, are hugely profitable and, and others are not. Uh, and, and I heard similar things from from other people in other industries that uh, that yeah. there's no one size fits all directory in in some categories one directory really gets high quality traffic yeah other yeah. It, it's different yeah and uh, as as in AdWords uh, I think that you know the price can go really really high I mean for webinars for example it's the same it's almost the same price you know mm -hmm. and uh, I believe it's everywhere the same I mean there is for example Nicola is asking for a lot of platforms uh, other platforms that does that and you have Captera, G2 Crowd, Get App and our alternative to and all those guys they have pretty much the same pricing you know and uh, if you can afford one you can afford the other and you get pretty much the same traffic and but I don't know if being on all those platforms and doing paid campaigns on all those platforms at once makes sense. Uh, I mean, if you had to choose one, for example, do you think that there is one that makes more sense than the other? Well, I will go back to being findable, right? So, so yeah. in every business, there's probably one of these directories which gets uh, highest ranked in Google search, and maybe mm -hmm. which is best known in among the target audience. Probably, should, probably should be. Uh, maybe dominate in, in or focus on, on one or two of these channels, not try to do everything. But okay. uh, but it's very easy to test these channels. So I wouldn't I would I would think it's uh, the best approach is to trust test them all or test a large number and then work to a small mm -hmm. number from there. Yeah, but again, this is not something that would you recommend to do f as your early stage start. I mean, you can get some listing here there for free, but doing some paid. Uh, acquisition on those platforms is not probably the right move when you're early stage startup and you're just starting out, correct? Uh, for some startup, I actually have advice to do that because it's uh, it's uh, it's relatively easy to get. Uh, I mean, you do need reviews, so maybe it's not the first thing you do, but maybe it's the second or third thing you do because uh, mm. you need reviews and you have reviews in your customers, and then you have a chicken and the egg. Okay, cool, and. Um, uh, you know, about being findable, is there any, I mean, outside of the Chrome extension, uh, is there any other big hustle that you guys did at the beginning? Or did you, you know, build like the steady growth, you know, one brick by brick, big, big break brick, and now, and didn't have any big launch or any big hustle that, you know, uh, skyrocketed your growth? Yeah, we haven't had kind of big um, campaigns, the big launches, which direct, which kind of, 
uh, which significantly um, changed the directory. Uh, apart from, I think, in the first year uh, when we were operating, uh, we settled out in Estonia. We had a, okay. a product for MVP, which customers loved, but the growth was quite small. And mm -hmm. then uh, once the founders had pitched their way into AngelPad and had participated there, made contact with AppSumo, made a promotion there, then one day Robles Global came to the uh, AngelPad office and then uh, shot a, a, a video about Pipedrive. All these things added up to an effect where we have the same MVP, but it was in the hands of people in, in the valley, not in Estonia. So mm. yeah, product. But then the growth really, uh, the growth curve really changed because more people uh, who were influential were using the product. Okay, so uh, you, you didn't do any big hustle, but you do something pretty much strategic. Is that to putting the product into the right hands to make sure those guys, you know, start talking about the product, and then you know, like the snowball effect. Yeah, so it's 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 not so it's not enough, unfortunately, to have a great product. It also needs to be. A great product in the hands of the right uh, people. And, yeah, and that's the epicenter for that is slightly different for different products. Uh, for sales software, being in in the valley was a was a great choice back then. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's different today. I don't know if if Paris is a good place or France is a good place to launch uh, good products, but uh, but definitely the geographic element still is important even in this uh, network. Yeah, I, you know, um, I think it was, yeah, it was the, for the last SaaScast, we had uh, Chat Mogul here on stage and we talked about European uh, SaaS, right? And you started in Estonia. I mean, it's a quite small digression, but how, how did you manage that building a product in Estonia and selling it abroad? How do you handle mm -hmm. this marketing, you know, marketing speaking? Uh, I mean, there is a lot of, you know, language issues, stuff like that, that comes along. How did you handle all of this? Uh, I think it's easier coming from Estonia because Estonia is a, is a tiny market. Uh -huh. um, so if you really want, if you want to not just have a hobby, but if you want to pay your bills, you have to think globally. And then the first language you add to your product is English, Estonian. So thanks to the, thanks in brackets, to the large market, the, to the small market, everybody thinks global from day one. Uh, which I think, uh, and also we we gotta then add it because we know that world is is more than just one language or in English or Estonian. We added uh, multiple languages early on. Mm, okay. So uh, you know, having been localized early on, uh, also got attraction in countries like Brazil, um, which mm. which we wouldn't have had. It, had we only launched in English or Estonian? Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, okay, you were kind of forced to be, you know, international from day one yeah. because you started in Estonia. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, I just want to go back to Captera. There's a question on the questions section from Brad mm -hmm. saying, "Okay, I'm using Captera in my industry to get listed on the top ten listings. It's about thirty dollars a click. How do we assess if it's worth it?" Well, I mean, you have to. Um, click price is relevant uh, in a sense. Mm. Uh, you have to account. Click, I mean, click, click price along with conversion and then, um, and then ARPU and then lifetime value. Uh, so I think based on click price, uh, we wouldn't maybe bid on some keywords, or maybe we, would, we wouldn't use some channels. Maybe we can if somebody sells you clicks at like one cent per piece. That's not a reason to use these clicks. Uh, it's really I think uh, testing these channels, uh, all channels with a small uh, with a small budget, quite calculating the lifetime value and then seeing does the price you pay for each customer uh, make sense compared to your lifetime value. Okay, cool. So you should focus on lifetime value and test channels according to uh, all the value they can bring for each customer. Um, it, it may be that if, I mean, if you, if customers then charge, if you charge customers $1,000 per month, mm. $30 per click is cheap. And yeah. also, if it converts well uh, to trials and trials to pay, and it may, may be really cheap. And maybe you should, yeah. maybe you should pay uh, ninety dollars per click. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. So, so in the end, what really counts is yeah. So as you say, the lifetime value and you know month to recover that uh, paid acquisition. So if you have one paid plan at thirty dollars and 
your cost of acquisition for one person is indeed $30 because the platforms cost $30 a click, then you have one month to recover that, uh, that price. So yeah. Okay, cool. This is what the lifetime value actually matters. Um, okay. Uh, also there is a, oh, I think there is another question here. So let's dig in. Uh, can you explain how you work from your uh, with your sales team at Pipedrive? How do you organize? How do you organize? Uh, how do you work with them? What are your goals? And when did you implement this scoring per lead? Mm -hmm. So um, essentially, for the for the first four years of the company, we didn't have a sales team. We're a self service product uh, targeted at uh, at small teams who are pretty happy to to look around themselves um, and then sign up without. Uh, this year we added the sales function or actually end of last year so some, some leads we follow up and of course we also talk to larger customers but the but sales is not our um, uh, maybe it's, it's beginning to be now but historically it wasn't our kind of strength which is strange the sales tool was not very good at selling uh, previously um, that, that's interesting right this is something that is I don't think it's really common to say uh, for a B2B startup mostly in SaaS to you know, you don't have any, you know, sales force um, from from the beginning. I mean, I don't think that's common. Uh, how do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, it's what, what kind of, uh, what target audience you go after. We went after small businesses and kind of startup like companies early on because that's the market we knew back then. And that worked mm -hmm. us, uh, well. As we started attracting large customers, um, mm -hmm. And as we wanted to scale the company, uh, then we added the sales function in year five of, of operation. Actually, I think the first yeah. people came aboard on year three, but we okay. the sales uh, a year ago. Uh, okay, so on year three. Okay, and how did you uh, how did you approach that new sales? You know, coming in. I mean, how did you organize yourself, and how did you you know. Uh, build your uh, sales pipeline between you know the sales team the marketing and how did you you know make the pipe connect uh yeah we we uh this may be not surprising but we got organized with pipe drive <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> makes sense the bad, the bad, at least we had a very good tool to use mm -hmm. um, and um uh, but i think i think i think there's other companies who are more experienced in kind of the marketing qualified lead sales qualified leads world uh, pipe drive, I think, is is largely self service and we also do sales, uh, and on top of that, okay, so we we uh, I can't say we have figured out how to perfectly connect sales and marketing, but it's it's work that is ongoing right now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the how do you say? I mean, today, how can you say that that lead is more qualified than the other? I mean, is there any specific channel, any specific attributes? to a lead that makes that lead, you know, uh, hot for you. I mean, yeah. So we look at, we look at, um, I think Mark Kudu has been with SaaS yeah. before, right? So their tool is, is helpful. Uh, looking at somebody's email address is helpful. So non-Gmail is more valuable than Gmail, of course. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then we have, a, we have a data analyst uh, who has helped to build some really cunning models, which look at usage. And then um, cool. we use our own algorithm alongside Matt Kudu to see who's likely to convert or not and who should be called or not. That's cool. So you connect Matt Kudu to PipeDrive and you know you qualify, you say, okay, that guy is pretty much ready to upgrade or ready to uh, you know, upgrade from trial to paid, actually. Yeah. I'm slightly out of depth here because I know that we are doing it. I don't know the specifics of it. It's my it's my it's my colleague who's working closely with the sales team to okay. help connect the the kind of engagement metrics and not the metrics to to the bike track. But yeah, we have we have connected that to to bike track. Okay, cool, awesome. Uh, through the API, right? There is any proper integration right now? There is no native integration, no. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so there's another question from Brad. Uh, I think it's more related to product actually, but what to, I mean, we have the same issue actually. I mean, you started being international from day one. That is, there is a lot of um, complexity in building multiple language products. And what tools did you guys use to, you know, 
expand those languages. This is a huge, uh, I mean, it's a huge pain, you know, for us at least to build new languages for the product. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we had to roll our own. And uh, at the time, I thought it was a waste of time. I think for our engineers, and then we had very few engineers back then. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent um, weeks, if not months, on building, the, building a system which allows us to add new languages without kind of extra dev work in the future. So that then if we add a new language, text strings get automatically sent into translation service. So they come back and new pages are added automatically. I thought it was a waste of time back then. Uh, in hindsight, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a, a hugely profitable, useful thing for us. Uh, yeah. And it would, I think I, we were lucky, I think, in the timing that some couple of people felt strongly about localization and they pushed it through. Whereas the same resource could be sent on, on building features. Mm -hmm. Getting the time guy, like, when is when is a good time to to turn your uh, your uh, your focus from from core features to localization? I think that's a perfect time to do that. Uh, and and we were, yeah. we were lucky in the sense we have that a couple of vocal advocates of that function but, uh, in the team, and we we did it. Maybe but, but you, you think that was the right move, correct? I mean, you, you, you wouldn't yeah. change it. If you had to do it again, you will do it again, correct? Yeah. If I had to do it again, I would, I would push for it two months earlier. But, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, there's another question from Nicola. So we'd like to implement a re-nurturing program at Spendesk. Uh, they have content business use case uh, for leads who got out of the funnel. How do you begin to implement frequency automation, Okay, so basically, how do we implement this renurturing program? And then I'm not the best person to answer. We we have a very uh, I think sophisticated uh, sign up uh, sign up nurturing program, but some mm -hmm. it drops out. We just have the usual. No, it's basically when uh, for leads that got out of the funnel. So, yeah, so uh, we do just the basic newsletters and and occasional emails, but we're not we're not created that. D'accord. Okay. All right. So you don't. Yeah. Okay. But did you get any results just from that content that you push, or uh, didn't you know push that topic really far so far? I mean, we, we use a tool called Vero uh, for uh, email automation. Okay, cool. Some other good tools, like uh, I think, uh, um, increasingly hearing good things about the autopilot as well. Uh, and you can also do it in Mailchimp. I've heard. I think as long as you have something which is uh, which lets you send emails based on activity and inactivity, that's that's, that's a good, a good okay thing. cool and what about that uh sign up nurturing program then uh, what how, how does it be what what would you recommend on building a you know sign up nurturing program for example just to give you an example for us now basically we have three emails the first one sends uh, the basics basic how to use the product what will be you know the most common technical issues that you can find and how to handle them and then you get basically as as the week goes by you get some more specific stuff, you know, more advanced feature, more advanced stuff to learn on. Um, you know, it's a basically like a broad to specific approach. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, yeah. yeah. Uh, for us, it's a similar setup. Uh, so you start from like a broad welcome message, value proposition, and then you work your way to uh, more specific features. We try to connect it to what users do and don't do in the app. So that if you have done something, then we don't tell you about it. And if you haven't done a thing which we've seen from the data is important, then we'll mm -hmm. sure tell you about it. Um, it's tricky to measure the impact of that because, I mm -hmm. mean, it, you get into specifics and even at our scale, it's sometimes hard to measure, but uh, try triangulating some data and, and using common sense, I think, uh, mm -hmm. And using uh, activity and inactivity seems like a good thing to do. Okay, so you believe that uh, activation rate could be a good metric to follow, you know, uh, uh, from those emails that you send. And say, okay, those those that campaign really impacts my activation rate post sign up. Uh, yeah, and and um, I think we could we could easily do an A/B test where we just don't send these emails to a subset of users. Yeah. But, but we don't, I mean, 
we don't want to learn to measure everything, but uh, that's something, that's a lesson where I'm just thinking that it's the right thing to present this. Event. That's really interesting. This is something uh, uh, we did while I was working and mentioned. Basically, we had this uh, cluster of uh, customers. So it was 10, I think it was 100 or 10, whatever, it doesn't matter. So ten, let's say 10 cluster, and you have one tenth of those guys that didn't get any onboarding email, any nurturing emails, just the just the essential to you know get the app working, you know, just the confirmation email and stuff like that. That will be the the test control with only the organic stuff, right? Uh, it will basically grow organically, and then you have all the other batches, all the other clusters with all the you know. Uh, the nurturing program, there's a referral stuff, etc. And, you know, and it turns out that the organic program, I mean, the organic cluster that didn't get any nurturing and the one that was getting the nurturing was, you know, getting the same, pretty much the same result. All right. <laughs> so it was really, okay, so we're not that good at nurturing, you know? So uh, having group control gives you the ability to say, okay, this is getting somewhere, and this is not. Yeah, I think I think yeah. Sometimes it's 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 a I think it's a sad reality marketing. Sometimes you do <laughs> something which is either super creative, or super strategic, yeah, and, and you just see that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. People have uh, people get to the same point without your help or without you kind of bothering them. Yeah. So yeah, as you said, there is maybe there is a bias that people in the cluster will you know, let's say coincidentally getting uh, their hands on a product, you know, in a very simple way, you didn't have to get all those emails and because they belong to some specific categories of people, I don't know, but maybe, you know. So, okay, cool. Uh, all right, so we are past time. I have one question, one last question maybe, and if there is any more questions from the audience, we'll take those. Uh, my question will be, if you have to change Anything else? If you have to change anything in the marketing, the way you did from day one at Piper, right? what would you change, if any? I would have started to scale the team and processes earlier. Okay. So I think I was I was um, stuck too long in trying to work on channels and uh, and kind of and the efficiency of marketing, where I should have already kind of shifted focus in building the team. And working on systems so that members of the team don't bump into each other. Uh, so I think it's sometimes it's difficult to be like if, if you're in a. I think there's a term fog of war. If you're going to be in action, you don't really can't analyze it yourself from from the side and see what should be your key priority. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's something I would do earlier. Okay, makes uh, little sense. Yeah, I think, I think now and I hope it wasn't terminally late. Now we are going to uh, we've grown to more than thirty thousand customers. 21 people in the marketing team wow now but, uh, but yeah maybe maybe we should maybe we should be at 25 or 30 right now but, okay so uh, 30 people are the marketing only uh um, today we're at 21 but but maybe maybe we, if had we started scaling earlier maybe we would be at a better place right now who knows okay cool and what are you doing it's just basically they all take care of one channel or how do you organize 20 people around marketing i mean I don't even know how to imagine a team of 20 people doing marketing all day. How do you? Are you saying there's too many marketers in one? No, the no, there is not enough marketing in the world. I'm not <laughs> saying that. I'm just, okay, how do you even organize those people? Um, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we, we're figuring it out. But we have an acquisition team, uh, so we're mostly doing Legion, so paid content, growth engineering. Uh, we have an engagement team, so people working to get signups. Uh, to um, uh, to convert into paying customers. Okay. Uh, we have a, a small and growing creative team. We have a product marketing team, and we are building a, a communications team. We're hiring, by the way. If anybody is listening, we're in. Okay. Cool. That's and awesome. Join. Yeah. So if you join, join Pipe Yeah. Totally. Cool. May become that thirty thirtieth guy on the marketing team. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right. So, uh, guys, if you have any questions, um, the time is now. So send us a message in the chat or questions or whatever and uh, let us know. Uh, <laughs> so you have a message from Nicola saying, say hello to Jenna, <laughs> your accounting team. <laughs> right. That will say, Jana. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, guys. Um, thank you a lot, Andrews, for being with us today. Um, 
thank you guys for participating to this uh, new episode of SASCast. Um, this is actually the final one from 2016. Um, the next one will be probably by mid January with uh, uh, probably with someone from your founders. And we're not for, for once, we're not going to talk about sales and marketing. It will be a new topic. Um, but I'll send you the email uh, when that uh, comes out. All right. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Andres. And uh, have a great uh, pretty much Christmas Eve and uh, everything that goes after. All right. Thank you, Gilles. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.